Welcome to Reading the Gospels Together for Thursday, May the 28th, and today we're reading Luke chapter 7. Now, our chapter begins in Capernaum, which is now home base for Jesus, more than likely staying at Peter's home. Matthew tells this story as well in chapter 8 of his gospel, but Luke's account has some very interesting things going on. Now, we learn that a centurion has a highly valued servant who is ill. Now, a centurion, as I'm sure you know, is a commander of a Roman group of soldiers, likely based in Capernaum to monitor the cross-border tariff collection and to keep an eye on the main road. Capernaum was close to the border between the tetrarchies of Herod and Philip, and crossing between those areas, you had to pay duties, of course, and there was also a main road just to the north of the town. If you're going to have a Roman military police presence on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, then Capernaum is where you'd put it. Now, listen to Luke. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. So, why doesn't the centurion come himself, as in Matthew's account? There are a couple of possible reasons. First, the centurion knows that any highly regarded religious Jew would be very reluctant to have direct interaction with a pagan Roman. It would result in ritual contamination as well as bad press among the people. Also notice the centurion sends some elders of the Jews. Now, Jesus is, of course, Jewish. So maybe these intermediaries may sway him when otherwise he might tell the centurion to go mind his own business. The next line seems to confirm this hypothesis. When they came to Jesus, we read, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Now, We know Jesus, and we know, as in Matthew's version, that Jesus would have been happy to deal with the centurion directly, face to face, but the centurion didn't know that. Now, the next interesting thing, listen. He was not far, Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Well, now that's just an astonishing thing for a high-ranking Roman officer to say. The Roman, he's, what he's doing, he's accommodating himself to the prejudices of the day. And that's mirroring how devout Jews in their contempt of the Romans would have been, that's what they would have been saying and thinking. Jesus, of course, wouldn't. But this story can't help but remind me of another event Luke records in the book of Acts, when a centurion named Cornelius sends for Peter to come to his house and share the gospel. Now, Peter, upon arriving, tells the centurion, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. And that's the law that the centurion in Capernaum is being sensitive to when he's dealing with Jesus. Now, in the story of Peter and Cornelius, God changed Peter's mind. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 10. And I recommend that you do so as soon as this video is over, because these stories belong side by side in the telling. There's a lot of common elements that are shared between them. Now, the surprises are not over. Listen to the centurion's friends who brought his message to Jesus. Just say the word and my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, this is an astonishing recognition of Jesus' true authority. The centurion knows that Jesus just has to say the word, and his servant will be healed. Say the word, meaning give the order, and the healing will take place. Now, notice Again, Jesus never speaks to the centurion directly, just through the intermediaries. Jesus never even meets the sick servant. Everything is done at a distance, but the healing takes place nonetheless. We're not told whether or not the servant was a believer in Jesus or had any faith in this process whatsoever. It's all between Jesus and the centurion at a distance. So, as we read... When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Wow. 
Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and they found the servant well. Uh, we're amazed too. And wouldn't Luke's non-Jewish readers be pleased to hear this story of a Gentile, a Roman centurion no less, being commended for his faith. It's hope for us all. Now, it's odd that our next miracle is not as well known as this or as many others. It happens in a town called Nain, which is to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee. I've often driven through there as a major east-west highway passes right by the town these days. I'll read the story out to the group as we pass by in our bus, and a surprising number of people say the story's new to them. But Nain was being visited by Christian pilgrims for well over 1,600 years. We even have an account from an intrepid lady named Egeria, who wrote a wonderful account of her travels in the Holy Land in around 380 AD. She wrote, In the village of Nain is the house of the widow whose son was brought back to life, which is now a church, and the burial place where they were going to lay him is still there to this day. Well, in the 1880s, the Franciscans built a little square church over the ruins of the one that Egeria saw. And a couple hundred meters away are indeed a series of tombs cut out of the side of a mountain, probably where that funeral procession was heading so long ago. Now imagine that procession, a widow whose son lay dead. And we read, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Very complicated Greek word, literally meaning he was deeply moved in his inward parts. And he said, don't cry. That's amazing. Again, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Such simple words, but such powerful compassion. Remember that the Lord sees us in our times of grief and his heart goes out to us as well. What happens next is a foretaste of what we too shall experience as at the resurrection we are reunited with those who have died. Then Jesus went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. You know what I always wonder when I read this story? What did the young man say? I'd love to know. Perhaps we'll never know. But we can imagine, we can well imagine the joy in his mother's heart. We're running out of time for this chapter. We've covered John the Baptist. There's a lengthy account of the story of John the Baptist that comes next. And we've covered that extensively in our other videos. But take time, however, to read the story of the sinful woman washing Jesus' feet with her hair. The story is unique to Luke. It reminds us of another story, the story of the sister of Lazarus pouring expensive perfume on Jesus' head. But, but this one is very different. Now, what's really shocking about this one is the intimacy. Read it and put yourself in the place of the host of the dinner. You have an important guest over and then this happens. If you aren't scandalized by the story, you aren't reading it correctly. And then read it again, putting yourself in the place of the woman. It's incredible. It's a a risky story for Luke to tell in a deeply conservative society. But Luke was faithful to his sources and faithful to the stories of Jesus. Now, tomorrow, chapter 8, two parables, four miracles. And when reading the miracles, look closely for how people reacted to what they saw. And how would you react? We'll see you then.